I'm going to introduce a bit more language here. Like we talked about modulus and argument, um, one of the things that we need is the terminology to be able to stop saying like long phrases. I'm just going to speak about them specifically, right? So we've talked about the normal form of a complex number starting with this x plus i y business, okay? Now this form, I've resisted naming it until now because this is the only way that you talked about complex numbers. Um, but now that we have this other way of representing them, I'm going to give you some names. Uh, I'm going to give you three, okay? Firstly, because this is kind of where we start, and it's the most common way that you will see complex numbers represented, um, it is sometimes called the standard form. So this is just the regular one that we see, right? However, as you've been seeing here, we connect it to the complex plane, which looks so much like the Cartesian plane, that that's why we call these x and y frequently. So you will also see this name, and this is the name that the syllabus prefers. Um, you also see it called Cartesian form. So when they say, hey, provide me a complex number and write it in Cartesian form, this is what they mean. Uh, there is one other name. It's the name I uh, sort of grew up with, and it's sort of my preferred name, but the most important thing about it is that you recognize it, whether you prefer it or not. Uh, it's also sometimes called rectangular form. And the reason for this comes again from looking at the complex plane. If you draw up, you know, any complex plane, I chose all my bad markers today. I don't know what happened. That one's okay. Uh, if you think about the x and the y, where they sit on here, right? We drew a triangle in here with x and y, but you could also draw a rectangle with x and y. Can you see where it might go? Um, this one here, which we drew before, there's your y. If you place your x up here, then with the origin, you form this rectangle. Okay, so you're going to see x plus i, y referred to in all of these different ways. You need to be able to recognize them. And this other form, I am going to change markers because that's going to bother me. I'm going to go with, that one should do. So we've written it as r out the front, and then you've got cos theta plus i sine theta. Okay, so how do we describe this? Well, what, did we, what name did we give to r, that distance? We call it the... It comes from the radius of a circle, but we called it in this context the modulus, right? So you might call hear this called modulus, and then the theta is the argument. argument. So you might hear this called modulus argument form. But we usually try and save time when we have names for things like this. So you might hear that abbreviated to mod arg form. And if someone is exceptionally lazy, like I was when I was giving you the title today, and I like this because it sort of refers to what's going on like in a visual way, um, because this is all based on a pole, namely the origin, um, the name that I prefer, and it's the laziest one, is polar form, okay? But they all mean the same thing. So how do we convert back and forth between these? Converting x plus y, y, and r cos theta plus sine theta. All right. Going to give you an example. So, if we had a complex number like, I actually picked one specifically for this. Where is my complex number? Oh, there it is. Root 3 plus i. Here is a complex number. It's in standard Cartesian rectangular form. You can see the real part and the imaginary. Oh, by the way, sorry, this is a bit awkward, but there is one more name for this one which I forgot, which is a bit weird. It's called real imaginary form. I find this name strange because it's like, well, that's what a complex number is. But I'm just saying it because you will see it and someone's going to ask me a question, so there you go. How do we take this form, which separates the real and imaginary, into this form? We need to think about all the things that we just set up over here. For starters, we want to begin with our modulus. How do we find that? R equals. We already stated it, right? Fantastic. Square root of, and then you're going to have the squares of your real and imaginary components. So in this case, you'll have negative root 3 squared. That's the real part. What's the imaginary part? One. It's 1 plus 1 squared. Is that all right? Um, if you get teachers who are giving you nice numbers, you will see that this ends up with something friendly. This is the square root of 3 plus 1, of course. So we're going to get the square root of 4, which is two. great. So we have a modulus. Now from here, I'm going to take those two equations, the x1 and the y1, and I'm going to use the r value, which I've just found, and I'm going to solve for theta. So I can say, think about this, if x equals r cos theta, therefore, have a look, have a look closely, you've got all the information you need, the x coordinate is negative root 3, yes? The r that we just determined was 2, and then I've got cos theta. Is that all right? 
tidy it up a teeny amount, cos theta equals negative root 3 on 2. Okay. Now this of course is not enough information to work out uh, specifically which angle theta is, so I'm going to go to the other equation over there, which is in y. y is equal to? R sine theta. Very good. In this case, my y coordinate, like you guys told me when we were working out the modulus, is 1. And I already worked out what r was, it's 2. So I've got sine theta equals a half. So you can see we've given you nice numbers that are, are corresponding to exact values. Do you see that? And you'll see that come up a lot. Not all the time, but frequently. Okay. All right, now, what we can do here is we can say, on the complex plane, putting these two together allows me to unambiguously work out what theta should be. For example, I wonder how many of you know, by the way, we're in radians, and we're going to come back later on to why it's so important we're in radians and not degrees. Has anyone, is anyone comfortable enough with radians to know off the bat what are our two exact values in our normal domain that we think about that fit with this? Any takers? I'll give you a clue. The first one starts with pi. <laughs> pi on what? Pi on 6, very good, right? Pi on 6 is my first solution that goes with this. I'm just going to jot it down so it's not in my brain. What's the other one in our normal domain? Pi on. It's going to be... Pi on 3. 5, think carefully. It's going to be 5 pi on 6 as well, right? Now, just, just a note, I should pause here. As you can see, even though we're dealing just with like arithmetic before, right? We have very quickly moved into trigonometry land. And just a heads up, it ain't going away. Now, I know you haven't spent much time on that recently. If this is something where you're like, I can't, I can't think of these angles like immediately, you can see this is not the focus of the question. Th like this is the focus of the question. So maybe trigonometry is something which you're getting a signal now. I need to go back and revise. It will be super helpful for you, just like times tables are when you're dealing with fractions. You're like, oh, I've got to find common denominators. I do not want to be thinking hard about like the multiples of, of three or four or five. I want to be able to do this and do it like that. Does that make sense? Later on, we'll come to it. How do I determine between each of these which one fits? Well, I'm going to use this other trig ratio here, right? If you wanted, if you wanted to draw like a uh, quadrants diagram like so, right, from this, and I just started with this because it was positive, so we generally know it better. Um, which quadrants were I, was I in? Pi on 6 and 5 pi on 6 are the first and second, right? Because, of course, sine is positive, so you're in these two quadrants, yes? But from the other trig ratio, cos theta is this, it's negative. So that gives you more information. Which which quadrants do you have to be in if cos is negative? Second and third, right? So you're now over here. But you can see because it's the same theta, right? It's the same theta. It can't be in, in either of these. It has to fit into here. Does that make sense? Second quadrant. There was another way, by the way, a sneaky way you could have known that before you even wrote down any trig. How did we know we're in the second quadrant? Have a think. What do you say, man? Go back to the fact that this is written in Cartesian form, right? It's negative root 3, that's that way, plus i, that's that way. So that's another confirmation for you. You're in the second quadrant. Make sense? Um, you can see from here, by the way, you're going to get another pair of answers. But clearly, this is the one that you're going to be interested in. So therefore, wrong color, I can say, uh, I'm going to write it down just because we were doing that reasoning over there, quadrant 2. And the way I got that was from, number one, rectangular form, but number two, also from the fact that sine theta is positive and cos theta is negative. So that also tells you you're in the second quadrant. So theta equals 5 pi on 6. Is that okay? Now, let's think about this. It's always really good to do a sense check, right? I now have a value for r and a value for theta. So would it make sense to say z equals 2 bracket, I'm now just reciting um, mod arg form, polar form now, cos of 5 pi on 6 plus i sine 5 pi on 6. Does that make sense? Let's draw this thing up. I don't know why I drew so much on the bottom. Negative root 3, whoopsie daisy, 
negative root of 3 plus i. I want to get a decent sense of scale on this just to see if this is reasonable or not. So if I go negative 1, negative 2, does anyone know what root 3 roughly is? 1.7-ish? That's all I need because I'm only doing a rough sketch, so I'm going to place it about there. This is negative root 3. Plus i, I'm going to go up one unit, so I'm going to try and keep to scale so that I have something that I can go off here that's reliable. So if there's, if that's i right there, then here is where z should be. Does this seem to make sense of the angle and the modulus, the argument and the modulus, I should say? That looks like 5 pi and 6 to me. And also, noting that this distance has to be 1, then and this distance has to be 1.7, then that hypotenuse there does make sense to be 2, because it has to be longer than both of those. Make sense? Cool. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'm going to pause there. There is obviously way more to explore in polar form, but this is the beginning. On Canvas, you'll see exercise 1D is linked, and in the calendar, the particular questions are there. For those of you whose brains are ticking over, I really want you to go back to this conundrum I posed to you of why did I go through cos and sine, why didn't I just go through tan? If you really want to have a think about that, then um, if you come up with an answer, let Mrs. Lee or I know. We'd love to hear your theory. Okay?